Hello everyone, this is Professor Bunton, and I'm coming back as your disembodied voice to introduce you to week two of IS688 and web mining. Last week we talked about course introductions and logistics. Now we're actually going to talk about web mining, what it means, and its motivations. Before we get into that material though, first some important announcements. Uh, first, now everyone should be added to the course Medium publication, as you can see here. Uh, note that while we don't have any stories yet, you can see tabs for all the different assignments that we have. Uh, as I mentioned, all of you should now be added as writers for this particular publication. You should receive an email about that. Uh, if you have not already, let me know immediately so we can track down what the problem is. Uh, note that last semester's 688 course, all of their material, or the majority of their material is online. You can go see uh, their assignments or what they've provided as, as material for the medium assignments from uh, that course. You can see a number of them have garnered a pretty significant number of views. This top one about using k-means to seg segment customer bases has over a thousand views and you know, 300 or so reads. So there's a lot of good opportunity for you to see how other people have address some of the problems or answer some of the questions that we've asked for or that I'll ask you for for the module assignments in this course. Along that vein, we can now talk about the first one of these assignments, the module one assignment. The material for this is available on Canvas as is the material for all the assignments. I'll go through quickly what the assignment one looks like. Uh, note that it's notionally due a week from today, that's next Wednesday at 11.59, but as with all of the medium assignments, there is not a hard deadline for this. You are not penalized for being late. Uh, this is a notional deadline so you have an idea of when you should aim to try and submit this content. The first thing to note about this is that I'm looking for at least 500 words where you describe some interesting exploratory analysis of data that you've collected. So one of the things we'll talk about in this week is about APIs and doing data collection. Uh, so while for other parts of the class or for other medium assignments or for the semester project, you are not required to collect your own data, in this particular assignment, you are required to create a data set yourself. You can't use something that's prepackaged from Kaggle or some other space unless you happen to be the author of that data set. Uh, you have to collect data on your own. And the idea here is, you to use this assignment as kind of a foundation or a baseline for web mining or data mining in general. So if somebody were to ask you right now, do some data mining given some particular question, how would you do it? And at the end of the semester, you can go back and evaluate and review, well, what did I do then? How would I do things differently now? We can now talk about what your article should include. Note that the order of these uh, bullet points is sort of a notional idea for the outline of your document, or the outline of your, of your publication. Uh, First is you need to include a clear and compelling question. You cannot say, oh, I have some data, it's interesting to explore. You have to explain who wants to use this data, what questions might they have about this data, and how might they use answers to this question. And that's gonna, if you frame your assignment or all of your module assignments, your medium post this way, it'll be hugely helpful in helping you evaluate bugs or helping you evaluate actual performance or understand what's important about your analysis. So you need to have a complete compelling question about who cares about this data, why do they care about it, and how are they gonna use answers to this data. I'll take off points if you just say something's interesting, if you don't really explain what the question is, having a question here is really key. Once you've sort of outlined this question, then you can describe what data might you use to answer this question. Now an important point here is well, a lot of times you may think, well, I have data, let's extract some interesting question about it uh, because I have this data. Here, I want you to think about this in the inverse. You have some question, you wanna answer some question, what data do you wanna use to answer that question? Maybe the data is not ideal, but it's available. That's a totally legitimate answer to have that, well, I'm using this data, it's not perfect for this particular question, but it's easy and it's available, and this is what we're gonna do. Or maybe you have, data that's really good for this particular question, but small or biased in some way. So you can explain that, explain where the data you're coming, you want to use is coming from, why is it relevant to your particular question. Once you've done that, you can explain, well, how did you actually collect this data? Did you use some low-level library like requests to actually do web scraping directly or engage with some API? Did you use something like Beautiful Soup to do parsing of HTML or XML or something along those lines? Did you use some API wrapper like Tweepy or PRAW 
or some other R package or something like that uh, to actually connect to some service and pull data down that way. As long as you're explaining where the data comes from, that's the main thing here. You want somebody to be able to see, oh, this is where this data came from and how this person collected it. Ideally, you can include some uh, code snippets in your, in your post about examples for how you did this. Once you've described how you collected the data, now it's time for you to actually do the exploratory data analysis. Refer back to your question, try and answer the question with the data that you have. And maybe it's something relatively straightforward, like in a Twitter or Reddit context, who are the most popular accounts? What are the most popular websites shared? What are the most popular subreddits or hashtags? Something along those lines, as long as it's in service of the particular question that you have. It could just be some graphs explaining what, what these common things are or what the distribution of particular behavior is in this data. But here's your opportunity to show off whatever kind of skills you have in terms of uh, analysis or visualization, what have you. You can do that here. Once you've done that, I want you to describe any issues you encountered. This, anybody who reads this assignment, they'll probably have uh, or encounter some issue when they try and replicate it, or maybe there's some common issue you have with formatting and data cleaning that you had to deal with, or there was some nuance with authentication you had to do with requests or some, uh, some other API wrapper like Tweepy that you needed to deal with. Uh, here's your opportunity to explain those to make this a little bit more useful to somebody who is going to come in and re review or read this, this uh, Medium post a couple of years from now. Uh, as I mentioned in the exploratory data analysis piece, do include some figures or tables summarizing your findings. That's going to increase the readability of your assignment or the readability of your, of your article. That's going to help anybody you know, quickly glance through what are the important takeaways of this article. So I want something more than just code snippets here. Uh, I want you to have some kind of figure or visualization that gets at the uh, exploratory data analysis question that you're looking for. And then finally, what, what is the primary takeaway? What's the core answer to your question? And was there any limitation or what were the limitations in the analysis that you did? Did you have some particular issue with doing the data collection? Is your data biased in some way? Uh, is your analysis limited because you know, maybe you're looking at social media data that has text and imagery, but you could only analyze text. I'm looking here for some reflection about why is your analysis imperfect? Because no analysis is perfect. So it's important for you to understand, well, what are the limitations of my analysis? Because I'm going to give somebody some insight. I need to tell them what are the caveats around that insight. Uh, the key point here is to add the post to the class publication via Medium. You can go back to the Medium lecture where I talk about how to do that, uh, but it, I'll be frustrated and likely to take off points if you don't submit the publication or you don't submit your article to the publication if you just submit the URL via Canvas. You need to do both these things. Submit the URL via Canvas and try and add it to the class publication. All of you are writers now with access to that publication. I'll get a note about it, I'll review the article, and I'll post it once it's here. Finally, you need to tag your story. So there's an option for tagging in Medium. Tag your story with this IS688 Fall 21 A01. This tagging is important because that'll put this article in the appropriate tab in the course publication. So then if you want to quickly look at the Assignment 3 articles, you just click on the Assignment 3 tab, which will be using the 688 Fall 21 A03 tag. So here, use the A01 tag. And then finally, as is the case for all of your medium assignments, uh, the grading rubric is, avail is available for you to review. This is what it looks like. This is the one I'll use for the first assignment. Uh, some things to note. Most things are worth about 10% of your grade. The main thing that's worth the most here is the point number five with the exploratory data analysis. That's worth 20%. Everything else is worth 10%. Some things to point out. The motivation needs to be more than I have this data, there's this interesting aspect of this data, let's do something with it. You need to have a specific question, and I have points for that I, in the rubric about answering a clear and compelling question. Another thing to note is there's in item number eight, this section for excellence. This is kind of a catch-all. Um, you can get an A in the, in the course 
uh, without having to impress me. But if you have particularly good visualizations or your writing's particularly good or something like that, then this is a place where I will give you additional points uh, to reward you for doing a good job. Uh, on the flip side, if your article has a lot of technical issues or it's really hard to read or dense or very jargony or has a lot of, of spelling issues, you won't get as many points for excellence. So the idea here is you want to provide accessible and interesting and readable content for the larger uh, web audience. Moving on to the semester project, uh, there are five parts here. Let's talk about the project proposal since that's due next week. You may ask, what makes a good semester project here? So I'll give you some insight. Uh, primarily, you want to focus more on analysis than on engineering. That is, like your medium assignments, think about questions, not tools. You should think about what questions you're answering, who cares about these questions, what data do you have to answer these questions, and what are the useful insights you want to extract here. Not necessarily, what tools do I need to build in order to answer this question. We'll talk about the methods in the class. The class is meant to get you experience with the tools, but the tools should all be used in service of extracting insights. That's the core point behind data mining. You have insights that you want to pull out, and we need tools to help us do that. You need to be doing something more than just descriptive analytics. We're running regressions on small data sets. So the whole point for the web mining aspect, or as in the outlined or kind of hinted at in the textbook, we're talking about large data sets here. You should be looking at some data, sets, data set that's relatively large in scope, and you need to do something more than just some easy linear regression problem on one factor and another factor, or one independent variable and some dependent variable. Think about something more interesting here, an insight that's not directly obvious from the data. Also think about how you can use the modules to answer your question. So I've given you some overview of the different modules we have, and you don't have to use all of the modules to answer your question, or you don't have to display all the things you've learned from all of the class in your semester project, but you can think about, well, what are the examples that are provided in the modules? What are the sort of the overall ideas behind the modules? How might that help me answer some interesting or important question about some data set? That'll be a good path for you to explore. And then finally, be bold here. I'm not gonna take off points if you don't succeed in your analysis or something ends up being really hard. If you explore a question that ends up being harder than you thought, that's totally fine. Maybe you don't have a complete answer to all the questions that you have, that's fine. As long as you have explained, well, why is your question important? How did we collect this data? And how far did we get in answering this question? And then you're being clear about why this was more difficult. All that's fine, you can get a perfect score in this semester project from me, even if you don't answer all your questions. I want to encourage you to explore the data, explore the methods that we have here. So going back over the course modules for module two, which will start next week, you know, we'll talk about how we can look at the web or the internet or social media platforms in all these different places as graphs and how you can identify central accounts in these graphs. You can look at graphs over time, a number of different kinds of techniques you can use there to get insight into who's authoritative, who are the you know, central sources of information in a particular group, what are paths through networks, all these kinds of things. Useful stuff that you could do for your semester project. For module three, where we have basically data munging in some way, looking at hashing and data reduction or dimensionality reduction, all that in the service of being able to do similarity assessment. Uh, so then you can ask questions about, well, given a set of tweets or given a set of web pages or a set of images, how might we assess uh, whether one image is similar to another or one tweet is similar to another? or one product is similar to other products. How might we rank similarity here? Which will directly feed into module four on clustering. So you could do some project on you know, clustering different kinds of assignments or clustering different kinds of social media content or websites or products or anything like that. Because um, clusters, what is this hierarchical structure or latent structure that's built into some data set is something that's not necessarily obvious when you just look at or throw descriptive statistics at some data set. That's an opportunity for you to explore. There's a lot of opportunity in recommendation systems. Building a recommendation system is a uh, 
an interesting place to explore about, well, what kind of recommendations do we get for a particular kind of data set? Uh, if we look at different kinds of recommendation systems, how does this change the recommendations that you provide? There's a lot of potential work in how recommendation systems are used for decision support now and how you might tweak them to make changes uh, to suppress particular kinds of recommendations or amplify others. Some good opportunities there. Mining data streams, if you want to do something in real time or do something uh, on huge data sets that, you know, things that occurred days in the past no longer matter. So it could be a good opportunity to do something there. Uh, many of the more simple questions you might ask about the data can be made complex by bringing in this temporal element. Or you might do something about computational advertising. Maybe you have some advertising data set. Facebook has the ad, uh, their ad library where you can see you know, what ads were shared, how much did people pay for them, how, uh, what audiences were targeted by them. So there's opportunities to explore that too. A couple of you have already posted some project ideas in the discussion forum. I've tried to respond to those. Do use that resource for getting ideas or sharing ideas uh, with me and with your fellow students. And then finally, there's the weekly professor meeting. So a couple of you have already reached out to schedule these with me, so that's excellent. And this is going to be for your whole project team. Uh, but use this as well. Use me as a resource to run your ideas by me, get some feedback before you start writing things down for your proposal that's due next week, things like that. So I encourage you to check that out as well. The next thing we want to talk about are the learning objectives for, for the sets of lectures today. So there are a, a few. The first is defining data mining and differentiate it from other fields. I want, to, I want you to be able to differentiate kinds of data that we'll analyze. We've already talked about static versus streaming data, these kinds of things. Describe at least two types of APIs and data interchange formats. Provide at least three applications of frequent item set mining, which you should have gotten from your uh, reading in chapter six, and then explain the value in counting pairs when we are finding these item sets. So what does that, what does counting pairs really help us do? Uh, first though, let's focus on these two questions about uh, defining data mining and the kinds of data that we're going to analyze. Uh, so first, I want, this part is about giving you an overview and, and a foundation for what this class really is. And I talked about this a little bit last time, but we're going to go more in depth now. Uh, so what really is web mining? So we talked before about the goal of this class is for you to be able to extract knowledge from data. And just because you have data doesn't necessarily mean you have knowledge. To get this to this knowledge from the huge amounts of data on the internet, you need to be able to collect that information, store it, and then analyze it in some way. So for collections, this is a programming engineering kind of question, generally web programming, use of APIs. I'll give you a brief overview of that uh, in another part of the slides for today. Uh, storage is really about databases and, and such, or maybe flat files. There's not a whole lot of complexity for flat file storage to hear. Um, we won't talk very much about the storage aspect. We'll assume that there's that you have data stored somewhere and sort of abstract away if you're going to be using some sophisticated database or, or the like. If you want to use a database for your project, you are absolutely welcome to do so. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely welcome to do so. All right, and then the next thing is about data analysis. So we're going to analyze some data to extract some knowledge. And this is really the core of what data mining is about. Uh, so this class really is about data mining plus the internet or plus the web content from the web, right? So we have data mining, we have web data, or data that's that's somehow available on the World Wide Web, and we're going to try and access that data and extract useful insights from it using APIs uh, to get at the data that's that's stored on some server somewhere. So when we talk about web data, really what we're talking about is web scale data. So what is this? Uh, primarily, this is about uh, diversity and, and size of data. So web scale data is generally considered data that's too big to fit in memory for your uh, local machine. So this is why the Mining Massive Datasets book talks a lot or has a chapter about uh, the MapReduce framework for distributed processing. We're not going to deal so much with that uh, unless you want to for your project. But this is the kind of, of context in which we're working. That web scale data is generally very diverse and is often very large. 
So then working with that data, we want to use, apply data mining to extract insights from this web scale data. So what is data mining? It's a great question. It's not a, not a hugely clear answer. But really, what we'll talk about in this class, or for our purposes, data mining is the process of discovering insights. These insights need to be valid, which means that as we get new data, this these insights should hold, or we should be relatively certain that these insights should hold. So imagine if you're doing analysis on like business analytics for web logs or for advertising or for some marketing campaign. Some new customer comes in, hopefully whatever you learn, you have learned about all your other customers, you would expect that to hold for your new customer to some degree. These insights need to be useful. So that means somebody who is going to have these insights need to be able to act on them in some way, uh, help them make some decision. The insights need to be uh, unexpected or at least non-obvious. So if you are pulling some insight from a, uh, an e-commerce site that says, well, somebody who, who is purchasing cat food likely owns a cat. That's probably not a very interesting insight. Uh, maybe somebody who's purchasing cat food, this person doesn't own a cat. Uh, if you've made that kind of inference in some way, that's kind of an unexpected thing that you may be able to use or take advantage of. Uh, but the key thing is you're looking for insights that aren't uh, super clear or obvious or expected. And then lastly, the insights that you find need to be understandable. So this one's kind of uh, more nebulous, but the idea is the patterns or models that you're using or, or extracting from the data need to be interpretable or understandable because otherwise they're less useful. If you don't really understand the insight, then how do you make use of it? There are two main tasks that we'll talk about uh, for data mining. The first is, is primarily description. Um, we'll talk about what that means. And then there's prediction, so trying to understand something about the future. Description is trying to understand something about what's going on right now. I have a lot of data. Let's learn something about this data. And prediction is about, well, we have a lot of data that's talking or that tells us what's going on right now. Can we use that to understand what's going to happen tomorrow or for a new user or something along those lines? So as I said, description, uh, it's some examples of, of descriptive data mining tasks are finding similar instances or finding similar items. So if we have a large collection of movies or products or, in, or users or whatever, how do we rank them or, or order them or, provide, or identify two objects that are similar in some way? What does that mean? How do we extract clusters or group these instances into clusters and say, well, all of these objects are more similar to each other than they are to these objects over here. So that's a different cluster. Uh, describing different structures of the data. So the underlying data generating model or you know, how dense is the network, these kinds of questions. Identifying important elements. So this is very clear if we're talking about uh, social networks or citation networks or web networks, identifying who has the most influence, what, what uh, uh, user in some social network is most likely to move public opinion or what server uh, or what website or what domain is most likely to spread information, these kinds of questions. Prediction is maybe what you'd expect, predicting future values for some measure or metric that you have, uh, predicting some user's rating. So given a user who has some history, when you recommend some new, uh, new item, that's not in their history, can you predict their rating? Because you want to recommend uh, items to users who are likely to enjoy that item in some way. Uh, more specifically, it may be predicting ads that, are, that that user is likely to click, uh, or recommending new movies that that user is likely to watch, or products that that user is likely to buy. All of these are sort of prediction tasks where we don't know what's happening, uh, or we don't really know what the outcome of this of this prediction will be, but we have some expectation that we can get some idea. We have some expectation of what it, what it will be. When we talk about dating, data mining, though, uh, as I mentioned, it's not, it's not an entirely clear definition in, 
uh, about what data mining is. Uh, so, but we can say some things about what it's not. This is some of, some of these things we talked about last time. And that data mining is not just a question of databases. It definitely includes databases or can include databases through analytics. Uh, oftentimes, a database person may say that, well, data mining is just the process of running complex queries on, on an existing database. And it can be that, but it's not always that. Uh, primarily because, when we, especially when we talk about web scale data, not all the data that you have is nicely structured or stored in some in some database that you can run queries over. Uh, maybe it's a semi-structured data or unstructured data, and you need to find ways to featureize it, which we'll talk about uh, in module three. Or maybe it's uh, network data, and it doesn't lend itself directly to your standard kind of relational database. There's you have to use some other structure for it. A good example of this is if we have two uh, news articles. So this one is from the New York Times, and this one's from the Washington Post. Uh, we want to extract authors from this information or authors from, from, these, uh, from these articles. Now, extracting this author information may be uh, very easy if you have access to Washington Post or the New York Times database where they that they use to populate this information. Uh, but odds are you may not have direct access to them. Uh, so just doing some sort of query to give you or to extract the, the authors across two different domains is a potentially difficult uh, question that can't very easily be solved through databases, but we could solve it through data mining of this kind of web data by looking at the text of these, uh, these articles. Uh, likewise, you may think data mining is, is very similar to machine learning, but they're not quite the same. Definitely data mining can include machine learning or using machine learning models to extract insights. Uh, but data mining could also be about extracting and visualizing insights beyond just uh, training some model, because not everything in data mining uh, requires some sophisticated, sophisticated model. So for example, going back to this article question where we have two databases that contain uh, this information, you may try and do some synthesis of these databases and join them together or extract some sort of joint information from these databases, which may not require some sort of machine learning model, uh, but it does definitely could be a data mining or web mining kind of task where we're trying to extract this information uh, if we have two different structures that we, that we know or understand. Maybe we're doing some alignment task to say, well, in the New York Times database, the author column is called author, uh, but in the Washington Post database, the author column is called writer. How do you do this uh, sort of alignment? There's, no there's not necessarily any model there, but a human could very easily just map those two uh, columns without any kind of machine learning task. So I said that this class is about data mining plus the web. So what makes data mining on the web different? Uh, why do we have to have a class, or why do we have a class that's about web mining? Well, there are a number of reasons. First is that the web is really big. Uh, when we talk about you know, websites that are available, uh, here's a recent kind of estimate that there are you know, almost 2 billion websites available out there. Actually, the vast majority of them are, are not active, uh, but there's information, or at least data, available across you know, these 2 billion sites. So we're talking about large numbers of websites, potentially even larger volumes of data that we can glean from the web. The web also has many different kinds of data. So there's the content that you're familiar with, is what you post on Twitter, uh, the content that you read on, on BuzzFeed or some news article. There's also network data, structural network data about links between websites, uh, links between domains, links between uh, users and a, a social network. And there's web log data, which is very different that we don't necessarily have access to from a um, uh, clear sort of web browser kind of interface to the web. But log data is is especially valuable for a lot for lots of, of tasks. So content is what we what I just mentioned. So this is the stuff you're familiar with, uh, the reading of of articles, the content that you post on on your social media platform. So this is a huge amount of data. Network structure data is things like your social network or links between, between websites, trying to understand you know, what's the most influential website, what's the most influential user. You can answer these kinds of questions with network data. And then log data, like I mentioned, maybe it's 
how users are getting to your website. Uh, so if you're on uh, the back end and you're trying to understand, well, who's your audience who's coming to your website? Like my personal website, uh, who is visiting my personal website? You can ask questions about, well, what country do they come from? What city are they in? Uh, did they find my website by searching for me on Google? Or did they find my website by finding my Twitter account and then, and then clicking on the link to my website from uh, my Twitter profile? And if you are an e-commerce site or some sort of content provider like Netflix, this log material or log information is, is extremely useful. So if you're uh, Amazon, you can use what are called, what's called clickstream data to see, uh, well, this user clicked on this item, then did some browsing on that web page, and then clicked on this other item. Well, why do they choose that item? With enough of this logs of this clickstream data for a particular user, you can get a pretty good insight into that user's interests or what next thing can you uh, recommend to this user because that thing would, we hopefully would recommend things that they're very likely to click on which is useful to the to the user because they get to spend less time on the site uh, finding more things that they want and useful for the platform because then you have to spend less in bandwidth and you have a you provide a, a nicer user experience for your user all kinds of questions like that likewise if you're Netflix or Hulu or YouTube or something, uh, the sequence of, of shows that you watch or movies that you watch or videos that you find, um, where you click on one or you, you watched you know, the first 10 minutes of some movie and then you stopped and started another movie, all that logging information that gets stored on, on the provider's servers is super useful or has a lot of value uh, for learning stuff about the audience or the, the user base. So I hinted at this in that previous segment, the data on the web also varies hi highly in terms of structure. So there can be structured data on the web. This is what we talk about with databases. There can be unstructured data, like your, the content that we just mentioned. There can be semi-structured data uh, that has a different kind of format. Uh, so structured data, this is the database kind of thing that has some associated schema uh, where the elements or content of the of the data can be easily queried, have exact column names or or uh, constraints on the kind of strict constraints on the kind of data that's there, and you can run queries against the database and and do analytics that way. Unstructured data, as I mentioned, is like the content that you see, sort of raw text or images. It could be your email. It could be videos on YouTube. Note that there is still structure in this content. So your email still has you know, subject lines and, and two and CC fields and videos have titles and uh, raw content has you know, HTML segments that tell you something about it. But there's not a like, clear structure that's imposed upon this data, uh, mostly. Mostly this data is free form, can be filled with anything. Semi-structured data is kind of in between, so there are formats for this, like JSON, XML, CSV files. XML has some structure or some constraints for structure, uh, so it has tags and fields, and tags can have attributes and values. Uh, JSON similarly has keys and values, but no, there is no necessarily restriction on what's in these values. So XML has has schema information that can provide you know constraints. JSON generally doesn't have any sort of any sort of constraint. There's just you know arbitrary sets of, of keys and values, and maybe you have a relatively consistent structure for your JSON data, but there's no guarantee that from moment to moment that structure will be exactly the same. And the fields could be freeform values, all these different kinds of things. And in fact, there's a lot more semi-structured data on the web than there is structured data. There's a lot more unstructured data than there is semi-structured data. And how you deal with the two different or these different kinds of data can change. Next, the web is dynamic uh, and constantly evolving. So when we talk about streams of data and new data being added to the web, you know, hundreds of hours are being added to YouTube uh, every minute. So thousands of hours every day. How do we deal with this constant influx of data, which requires a different kind of approach? Uh, because this is these streams can be uh, in some sense, never ending. So when we talk about click logs, right? So people are constantly using your platform, 
which means logs about the things they're clicking on is con are constantly constantly being generated and evolving and and uh, sending information to you. And maybe logs from six months or six years ago mean very little compared to the value of logs from the past six hours. So the kinds of approaches you have for dealing with streams are different than just uh, static data sets that you may have on your site. Same thing with streams of data from social media, from live streams on Twitch or YouTube or these kinds of things. There's different kinds of approaches that we apply here. And then much of the web is not directly accessible when we're trying to view it uh, through APIs or doing some sort of collection. And in fact, the majority of the web is not. So there's this idea of the surface web. This is things you can search for via Google. So Wikipedia articles, uh, things you can search on Amazon, YouTube, uh, the blogosphere, these kinds of things. But then there's the deeper web, which generally is not directly accessible or indexable. Uh, because there's some authentication that you have to go through. Um, say you have some private forum or some website that requires uh, a username and password before you can see any, any information. Some websites can specify uh, that they not be indexed through what's called a robots file. These kinds of things. Medical records are a good example where they're available. I can log into my provider and view my medical records, but they're not searchable publicly. So it's very different than something like Reddit or, or Twitter where a lot of content is publicly accessible even if you don't have a login. And then below that there's the dark web which is a lot more sectioned off from the rest of the internet which makes it even harder to do searches on. And because of these kinds of issues, making the web search searchable uh, can be difficult because you don't uh, have access to all the data and the vast majority of data that you do have access to is not really useful to the vast majority of people. Uh, so this is called the abundance problem where 99% of the data you have is not interesting to 99% of your users. Uh, the limited coverage, I just, what I just talked about, and the keyword interfaces you have to search the web are relatively limited. Uh, so then you have to deal with trying to find keywords that match videos and images, which has its own kind of kind of issue. Uh, as an example of this, there's a paper about trying to uh, evaluate or estimate the value of Wikipedia Commons, which is a lot of, of media data. But one of the things that we find from this is actually, you know, for uh, this sample of 10,000 images that, that these authors drew from Wikimedia Commons, the majority of content is never actually used outside of the platform. Uh, so this is a good example of the abundance problem where we have a huge number of images and most of them aren't used. This is also a good example of a search problem where actually maybe many of these images could be useful but they're easy or they're not easy to find uh, because either the content-based image search doesn't work well or the person who uploaded the image didn't put a good explanation or set of tags that um, are relevant to most keyword-based queries. So yeah, just the majority of content on the web is, is difficult to get to and, and potentially never used. So when we get to this question, uh, we return to this question rather of web mining, you can say really web mining is about making the web more useful. How do we address some of the problems uh, that we just discussed about you know, how, how can we get better indexing into the non-surface web? Or how can we address some of the different kinds of of data, data types or data sets that we have. Uh, extracting data from unstructured content is a hugely common web mining task, but then we have to figure out how we impose some structure or we extract some useful information that we can then put into some structure from unstructured data. So that gets at these first two learning objectives where we've talked about, I've now introduced you to a definition for data mining, we've talked about how it's not the same as databases, how it's slightly different than machine learning, though it uses all of these things. We've talked about different kinds of data that we're going to analyze. Now, when we talk about how we access this data, accessing this, accessing this data is through APIs. And I'll skip over that to get more information about uh, APIs. I have a separate lecture on that that, I'll, uh, that is also available on Canvas. And then this last set of learning objectives are about chapter six and frequent item set mining. 
and what that's valuable for. So uh, the motivation for this uh, review of or introduction to frequent item set mining is, and we'll talk about this in uh, that set of slides as well, frequent item set mining provides a good motivation for a lot of what we'll do in terms of web mining and making the web more accessible or more useful. Uh, because when we when we talk about, well, these items appear together with these other items, that's a useful insight. And how we define item lets us do a lot, or lets us answer a lot of questions about uh, social networks or recommendations for products, uh, all these kinds of things that will show up throughout the semester in terms of motivating problems. So next part is on item sets. There's a separate lecture for that. Uh, I set this up this way so you can easily go to the API section and easily go to the item set, set section uh, of the YouTube videos and lecture rather than having to sit through, uh, if you want to review, rather than having to sit through all of the content that I just gave about introducing web mining and the introductions to, or the announcements from earlier uh, for this week, these kinds of things, you can see those, you can set those or review those separately. All right, for next week, as I mentioned, we're gonna start the second module where we look at the internet and graphs that are contained in the web, uh, graph structures of the internet itself, graphs, graph structures in social media content, graph structures in uh, places like Wikipedia, all of that is sort of on the table. There are a few sections to read here in the textbook, specifically chapters or chapter five, sections five, one, two, and three, and then five, five, where we're gonna introduce some ranking ideas and the general construct for networks. Uh, so you can check that out. Make sure you've signed up for Medium. I'm pretty sure most every one of you has done that already. Uh, if not, or you run into any problems here, let me know. Do make sure that you have the email saying you have been added as a writer. If you haven't uh, seen that, also let me know. Most of you have done your introductions. That's great. I can gloss over that. Note that your project proposal is due next week. Uh, do get that in on time because it'll give us some opportunity to go back and forth in the weekly meetings because your proposal is generally a notional thing, but it should be a good outline of at least what are you trying to do, what kind of data are you going to use, where might this come from. Uh, it's important that you have this down because I'm not going to let you totally change whatever your proposal is halfway through the semester. I'll kind of hold you to at least the general idea about the kind of problem you want to solve, the kind of data you want to use here. Uh, I already talked about the project ideas and what's useful here. We've already talked about the weekly professor meetings, though do schedule those with me if you have not already. Otherwise, uh, this a discussion forum for Module 1. Feel free to post there if you have questions. Come to my office hours on Thursday uh, or reach out to me via email.